So is it possible to have a prostatectomy without incontinence, without risk of incontinence? Well, actually to agree, to agree it is. And so today we're gonna to talk about that. This is kind of the central tenant of this channel. Where can we do cancer treatment better? And there are techniques that allow for better outcomes in prostatectomy. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about these techniques and explain why I do these techniques and why I've been doing them for about the last four years. Okay, so let me first start by explaining these different techniques. I mentioned earlier that there are different techniques in terms of how the prostate is removed that can affect the continence outcomes. So let me just clear, uh, quickly explain what this is. So uh, here you can see the bladder, the prostate. And in order to do a traditional approach for a prostatectomy, you'd first go behind the bladder and the prostate in this green line and separate the prostate from its posterior attachments. And then afterwards, go in front, separate the bladder from its attachment to the abdominal wall, and separate the prostate from its attachments to the abdominal wall. So you've now kind of taken this organ, you've separated behind it, and you've separated it on, on top of it. So everything's free-floating, so then you can do the side attachments, top, back, and take the prostate out. With the new technique called retzia sparing, you have your prostate here, and it's anchored against the abdominal wall. <clears throat> but in this retzia sparing approach, you just go from behind, and separate the posterior space and then wrap around the sides to liberate the prostate or to free the prostate. So in a retzia sparing approach, which is shown in green, you essentially keep the bladder in its normal location. You keep the anatomy of the sphincter attached to its normal locations. And in doing so, there is a hypothesis that might lead to improved continence outcomes. And it actually does. So let me show you how and let me show you what the data looks like. So this was a paper actually published in 2017, and I know this sounds like an old paper, but getting evolution in terms of surgical techniques is a gradual process. And those of us who have started doing this procedure in this technique, most of us started adopting this in like the early 2020s. Uh, I started, for example, in 2021. And uh, this uh, was only, er only really discovered and sort of characterized by an Italian in uh, the 2010s. And then gradually, this is becoming a more popular technique. But here, what they did in the study is they looked at patients who underwent a traditional approach to prostatectomy, and these are all robotic prostatectomies, versus those who underwent a retzia sparing prostatectomy, and they assessed the outcomes in terms of continence. And so here you can see that the way they designed the study is that they had 120 patients who got randomized. Half of them got a traditional prostatectomy, which they call anterior robotic-assisted prostatectomy, which is RARP. Uh, RARP for short, or a posterior robot-assisted radical prostatectomy, which is the retzia sparing approach in this uh, study. So if you've seen my previous video about uh, the risks or the side effects of surgery versus radiation, you probably will recall that in all of these studies, they, uh, the authors define someone as continent if they leak urine in a small amount or don't leak at all. So if they leak enough that one pad per 24 hour period is enough to control the amount of leakage, those people are considered continent. So uh, the authors actually did that here in this table. So here you're seeing the red line, which is on the top, retzia sparing, and then the blue line, which is below, which is the traditional approach. And we see that the higher the person is on the graph, the more likely they are to be continent. And if we look at this here, we can see that from time point zero, which is when the catheter is removed uh, after surgery, that um, within one week, around 75% of people are continent in the retzia sparing group from the beginning, and in the uh, traditional group, around 50%. Now, I gotta say, the surgeons in this uh, study must have been very good because a 50% continence rate at day one for a traditional approach is actually very good. But you can see that the retzia sparing approach is blowing it out of the water. And then when we look over time, we can see that the retzia sparing group is, again, getting a much earlier return of continence. And this is continence defined as using zero to one pad per day. Now, you're gonna see in the next slide, they actually break it down to people who use zero pads. And so here we're looking at the continence defined as people using zero pads per day. And you can see for the people who undergo retzia sparing, about 50% of them start with using zero pads per day or 46%. And you can see with the traditional approach, it's much lower, about 23%. And you can see again that over time, men tend to regain continence uh, 
full continence, meaning no leakage whatsoever at a higher rate in the retiosparing group. And at only three months after surgery, 77% of people were fully continent, never using pads at all, versus 56%. So here, you can see that this study only looked at the first 90 days. And we know from prior studies that people actually do gain more continence over time, just some people take more time based on usually the location of the cancer and how extensive of surgery needed to be done. Uh, it's important to note though, and I didn't include this here, I'll just take my word on it. When you look at these people who have the retzia sparing versus traditional approach, as the time goes on, over more time, the two curves start to meet. So what this means is that the retzia sparing group actually <clears throat> has better outcomes in terms of continence, but it's only in the beginning. So for the first like three to six months, they're better off. But from six months to nine months, the two groups seem to kind of converge at a very similar uh, outcome. And we see that at one year out, most studies are showing 95 to 97% of men are continent defined as zero to one pads per day. So you can see that in the long term, these two techniques are pretty similar, but in the short term, the retzia sparing people have a much easier year immediately after surgery in terms of recovery of continence. So the next sensible question is, well, what about erection performance? Is this technique better or worse? And the study I was just discussing didn't actually report on erection performance. So uh, I had to go to another study to get that data for you. So this is a study done in Keith Kowalczyk's lab. And this is actually uh, the physician I learned how to do retzia sparing from. So Dr. Kowalczyk at uh, Georgetown University uh, was gracious enough to teach me this technique. And here he shows the outcomes in patients who underwent retzia sparing or traditional approach. And the way he structured this is he had a series of patients who underwent a traditional approach, and then he switched to his newer technique called the retzia sparing approach and looked at the outcomes of those patients. And in this particular table, he's reporting the erectile function outcomes. And they didn't report erections of like a yes or no, rather they had patients do a questionnaire. And the higher the score the patient put on the questionnaire, the more likely they were to have um, erection problems. And so we can see that in the beginning, uh, both groups, whether they had retzia sparing shown in the dark red or dark orange, or traditional approach shown in the light orange, that both groups had pretty low scores, meaning pretty good erection performance. And we see from another table, which I didn't show here, that only about 50% of these patients had a complete nerve sparing, meaning preservation of both nerves. And that's probably because he is treating a high-risk cohort where cancer was invading into the nerve or close to the nerve in some people, and the cancer dictated that was necessary. But you can see that after the surgery, the erection performance got worse at six weeks, and then over time gradually did improve, which we talked about, better, which we talked about previously. You can see that over the course of 12 months, there was a gradual lowering of these, um, these scores, which are a score of how bad your erections are. And so essentially, they're getting better over time. And here you see that the uh, dark orange scores are lower than the light orange scores, which might give you the impression that the retzia sparing patients did better in terms of erections. But that's actually uh, not supported by the data because when we do statistical analysis, the statistical analysis show that the two groups um, actually uh, the differences or the improvement in one group versus the other could probably be explained by just stati statistical variation. And we needed a larger study to say if truly there is better outcomes in terms of erection performance with the retzia sparing than the traditional approach. You know, I look at this and I think there may be something there, but we just don't have enough evidence yet to definitively say that's the case. Okay, so now we're kind of getting to the place where most of my patients go, okay, so why isn't everyone doing this? Like, it sounds like the continence is better, the erections are about the same, maybe a little bit better. Why doesn't every doctor do retzia sparing? And there are two big reasons. The first reason is some, several of the early studies showed that there was a higher risk of a positive surgical margin, meaning that the chance of leaving cancer behind was a little bit higher in the people who had the retzia sparing approach than those who had the traditional approach. It was about 10% higher in some of the studies. And so people are like, oh, is this technique not as safe or is this a learning curve? And <clears throat> that's really not answered yet. Subsequent studies have shown no difference in the uh, positive surgical margin rate between the traditional approaches and retzia sparing, but there's been enough in the early days that people are hesitant. Uh, 
I believe, having done this procedure for several years now, that it is related to a learning curve, but I'll be very honest in saying that's speculation. We have a randomized uh, clinical trial ongoing with multiple surgeons from multiple institutions in multiple countries that should answer this for us. And we'll, we'll know probably within the next few years if there truly is a higher risk of positive surgical margin with retzia sparing. That's reason number one. Number two is probably the biggest reason. Retzia sparing is technically very challenging. It is not a procedure that sort of anyone can just like watch a video and be like, oh yeah, I could do that in terms of a surgeon. This is one of those techniques where I had to watch about 100 cases by an expert surgeon before I was like, okay, I feel confident I can do this. And as a uh, urologist who teaches other young urologists how to operate in their residency, I can tell you that going through the process of teaching is, uh, is challenging. And I see that this technique is, is truly not uh, easy to replicate for many people. And because of that, it limits the adoption. Uh, every urologist who's good at doing general prostatectomies, probably not all of them would be comfortable doing a retzia-sparing spar prostatectomy. And that's what leads to these uh, pretty small numbers of people who are doing them. For example, in Southern California, I'm one of three people in the entire region of Southern California, I think potentially the entire state of California who's doing retzia-sparing. And, uh, you know, that also, that kind of comes to the point of why I was hesitating and dragging my feet on publishing this video. Because, uh, you know, if everyone were to go seek retzia sparing prostatectomies, we wouldn't have enough providers to do them. <clears throat> then the final thing I do want to share with you guys is this is one of uh, the techniques which is showing really good improved early continence. There's another technique that's evolving right now that's um, becoming more mature and there's more data coming out called a transvesical radical prostatectomy. And that seems to have really good continence outcomes as well, but it has a lot of the same issues of retzia sparing prostatectomy and that it's technically challenging. And uh, that has even less data than retzia sparing prostatectomy. So nobody's clamoring to take that on just yet. So as you go through your journey and trying to find people who can you know, help you and take care of you. I do want to convey that there are opportunities uh, to try to make things better and to make your cancer treatment better. There truly are differences, but these differences um, are sometimes not worth it. For example, uh, the long-term outcomes in terms of continence with a traditional approach and a retzia sparing approach appear to be about the same, meaning that if you uh, go to the guy who's been doing it his way for a long time and is good at it, that's probably pretty reasonable. You might not have as quick of a return of continence and your recovery will be a little bit more challenging as a result because you have to do continence exercises for longer. But in the long term, it seems that the outcomes are about the same. And so I don't want to discourage someone who's in an area where you don't have access to providers who do retzia sparing to be discouraged because in the long term, outcomes do appear to be the same. It's for those individuals who are really hyper obsessed or really concerned about continence and are willing to travel to find someone who can do retzia sparing, maybe in those situations it would be reasonable until you know, the field evolved and everyone's kind of adopted these more advanced techniques. But that's it for now. Um, again, to all of you who are subscribing and sharing, thank you. It basically helps other people find your information. So just hitting a like button and subscribing or sharing these videos is what makes more people be able to find this. And we all know that there's terrible quality information sometimes online. And I'm trying to combat that with truly uh, high quality information from someone who's an expert in practices in this space. So if you found this, if you found this video valuable, uh, please go ahead and put a like. Uh, for those of you who have been making donations to Cancer Better, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the next video. Talk to you guys soon.